You're live. Perfect. Okay. Um, great. Uh, let's get started. Good morning, uh, everyone here. Um, here being uh, virtually on the uh, North American continent. Um, so today I'm delighted to uh, be the host and to welcome uh, David Su from uh, the National University of Singapore to give us a uh, very exciting talk. Um, just some few, uh, some some brief um, background information about David. So David Su is the uh, Provost Chair Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the National University of Singapore. Uh, he's also the Founding Director of the uh, NUS Artificial Intelligence Lab, or NUSAIL, I love the acronym, um, and uh, the Director of the Smart Systems Institute. Uh, David actually received his uh, BA, uh, Bachelor's of Science in uh, Computer Science and Math from the University of British Columbia on the other side of the country. <laughs> um, and he received his PhD in Computer Science from Stanford University in the US and is also now a fellow of the uh, IEEE. Uh, recently, he's been looking at uh, problems in uh, learning and planning under uh, uncertainty. Uh, and also in a human robot collaboration, which I think is one of the things we're gonna hear about today. Um, he also just recently received the Test of Time Award from the Robotics Science and Systems Conference in uh, 2021, which is fantastic. And in addition to um, being well known in the community and, and doing a whole bunch of fantastic community service, including um, chairing or co-chairing a bunch of international conferences, He's also currently on the uh, editorial board of the IEEE TRO and uh, IGRR. So without further ado, uh, David, we're very excited to hear your talk. And thank you so much because for you, relative to Toronto, you are on the almost exact opposite side of the planet. <laughs> so it is 12 hours very shifted. Right. So for us, it's morning. For you, it's late evening. So we very much appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to come and tell us about your work. Thanks a lot. Take it away whenever you're ready. All right, thanks so much, uh, John, for the introduction. As John already mentioned, we are exactly 12 hours apart, uh, and we are so far apart on Earth, but it's really great that technology allows us to still remain connected. So today I want to talk about our work uh, on a compositional architecture for robot learning systems. Right? Um, um, <clears throat> now, for a long time, we have robots like this, right, working in tightly controlled environment, performing um, uh, narrow specific tasks repeatedly as fast as possible. Now, more recently, um, with the advances of machine learning, now we also have this really cool robots from in-hand manipulation, right? Now, uh, <clears throat> just think about the this challenge of in-hand manipulation has been out there uh, for I say at least 25 years and uh, with all the uh, attempts and the failures and so on. So the achievement over here is really amazing, right? But, but yet we do not have robots yet at home that uh, operating in natural human environments performing a wide variety of different household tasks reliably. Right? So I want to put my position out here that to say that the challenge for the robotics today is to develop general purpose intelligent robots. Now, if you look at the robots on, on the left, mostly they perform like narrow specific tasks, even though they may be very sophisticated. And if you compare to those robots we want for the future, and the gap between them is really the, the vast variability in the task domain. We want our robots of the future at home to perform this a wide variety of different tasks in, in diverse environments. Now, to, uh, to achieve our dream, uh, there are two schools of thought. Let me start with the more, uh, more recent, recent one, and probably most of you will be familiar with that. And, uh, and it, uh, it uh, thinks of the robot system as uh, a giant black box function and represented maybe by a neural network. A robot system is just a mapping from the uh, input perceptual uh, perception to, to the output action for robot execution. Right. And uh, and uh, uh, now um, we use data uh, to train our uh, neural network uh, uh, policy representation. Now, if we get enough data, we will make our robot to uh, to perform in-hand manipulation, to do autonomous driving, or just we have enough data. Now, uh, I'm sure you have heard about this argument. They're probably familiar with it. Now, my question here is the following. Suppose we have managed to train such a sophisticated in-hand manipulation policy. 
What if next I want to change the robot by maybe shortening or lengthening the finger length of the robot? Or maybe that I want to change the number of fingers on the robot hand. Or maybe I got a new tactile sensor I want to put on. Or maybe I just want to move the position of the tactile sensor. What will happen to that policy? Well, most likely we will have to gather data over again and to train the policy from the scratch. Now for any of us who have worked on real robots, that uh, training from scratch training is really completely unattractive. Right? Also, the, suppose would this trained uh, manip manipulation policy generalize over different environment conditions and different tasks objectives. For example, instead of having um, palm up manipulation, I want to have palm down. And also, if we want to handle vast amount of data, how are we going to represent this data to store and use them? Now, uh, surprisingly, uh, this set of seemingly difficult questions have all been addressed in the good old fashioned classic robot system design. Now, if you just let's recall <clears throat> what we are told in our first robotics class, a robot system consists of modules for perception, state estimation, planning and control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For each of these modules, uh, we have a model for robot system dynamics, and maybe a model for uh, sensor observations, and also we have a reward or cost function to um, represent our task objectives. Now, um, <clears throat> we may build these uh, models by hand using first principles of geometry or physics. We can also train these models from there. Okay. Now, uh, if we want to uh, change uh, the make some changes to the robot, uh, we may be able. We then uh, in the in the classic approach, we just change the transition state transition model, the system dynamics model, and we change the sensor, we can change the observation model, and if we want to generalize over different tasks, we can design various different reward and cost functions. Right? Now, how about uh, data representation? Now, in this classic model-based approach, a model is a compact summary of vast amount of data. Right? Uh, even though sometimes we want to think that our model is based on first principles, but just keep in mind that uh, first principles are still grounded on data, right? It's just data from a long time ago, and people like Euclid and, and Newton figured out those first principles for us so that we do not want to, we do not need to work on the raw, raw data. Now, if you have any doubt on the technical merit of this, this old fashioned classic robot system design, let's just remind ourselves. Um, that, that more than 50 years ago, uh, the celebrated shaky robot um, was built this way. Um, 20 years ago, uh, Stanley, uh, the robot autonomous robot vehicle that uh, started the, the autonomous driving industry was built this way. In fact, most of the engineering system we encounter in our daily life is built this way. And yet, uh, this, this classic approach didn't quite manage to deliver as a policy or controller for in-hand manipulation. Right? So now we have two schools of opposing thoughts. Right? Now, one school thinks that I mean, a robot system is just a giant black box function to be regressed against data. And uh, their argument is actually very simple, simply that, can you do this? Or can you do this? Right? Now, uh, the opposing school uh, think of the robot system as a collection of modules and each of the modules um, is built on top of uh, um, models um, of, uh, of geometry and physics and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, uh, and it stores the value of, of models. You can find such arguments in the, in the literature, but also you can even spit over to, to the social, um, uh, social media. Right? It says that uh, um, you can find arguments that that, that uh, um, model is, uh, I mean, planning control and these models are rigorous and provides the mathematical guarantees and so on. It's so much better than learning and, uh, and black box and models and so on and so forth, right? Now, <clears throat> what I would like to talk about today is to, to ask the following question. Will we be able to put these two opposing views together and benefits from both? Okay. So this is our underlying motivation for uh, differentiable algorithm networks. It consists of two kind of simple ideas. 
right? So the first one is to uh, treat the neural network as a computation graph. And because it is, it is just a collection of neurons, each of them as a simple computation uh, unit, and that's connected together. We are going to use this computational graph to encode the robot algorithms and the models. Right? Now, uh, what does that really mean? Uh, let's look at some examples. For example, that uh, we want to encode, uh, use a neural network to encode a Bayesian histogram filter. So uh, this vector B over here is represents a probability distribution over the, over the states, and the Bayesian histogram filter is just a bunch of uh, um, linear operations, uh, matrix multiplications, right? So we multiply through the uh, state transition matrix and the observation model as well. Now we can uh, encode uh, the matrix multiplication as a convolution layer. Right. Now, uh, the convolutional kernel weights basically encode the uh, state transition, the, the parameters of a state transition model as well as the observation model. So when we train the neural network kernel weights effectively, we are training the model parameters for the ob uh, state transition as well as the observations. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, another example, um, we want to represent uh, a QMDP algorithm for decision making as a neural network. And QMDP is basically uh, uh, an, a very approximate model for decision making and uncertainty. It's basically just dynamic programming value iteration, and as you see over here, and you can see that you can recognize the Bellman's equation over here. And first again, that is um, a bunch of linear operations. And also, but uh, this is this is decision making. We must choose the best action. So we need an additional a maximum maximization operator, and we, which we can encode as a, a max pool layer in the neural network. Now, more than that, a value iteration is an iterative algorithm. We have k iterations, so we have to repeat this uh, uh, neural network slice uh, k times. And finally, we need an additional max pool layer to choose the best action. So this is what I mean by encode uh, uh, robot algorithm and models into a neural network. Now the second idea is even simpler. Now suppose we have a bunch of modules and we can have a module neural network module for state estimation and for planning and for control. We are just going to connect them together uh, in the sense that I'm going to take the output of one module and feed it into the input of the next module and uh, connect them together to compose a robot learning system. Okay. Now, this is uh, what I'm going to do with the uh, two modules that I have built so far, the Bayesian filter and the QMDP planner. I'm just connect them together. And finally, I'm going to take the output action of the decision module and feed it back into uh, the uh, input of the of the uh, uh, Bayesian filter, which is a state estimator. And that turns the entire system into a, a recursive neural network, right? Now, uh, when we execute this uh, recursive neural network, Basically, we, I enrolled the network in time, and you can see over here that uh, the uh, the filter will estimate, uh, will output uh, distribution over the states, and that will be gets fed into uh, the decision maker and and choose the action, and and to be executed by the robot, and then and we move on to the next time step. Okay. Now. Uh, over time, that uh, there have been uh, a lot of work in the literature to develop uh, neural network modules like this that includes uh, uh, modules for state estimation, fully observable planning, and partially observable planning, and the control, and so on and so forth. Even though that uh, that the most of the examples I have given here so far are using discrete states and actions, but uh, there is no difficulty at all to use neural network to encode uh, uh, continuous um, uh, uh, state and action algorithms, for example, uh, linear quadratic controllers, model predictive control, path integral control, these have all been available in the literature. So we have already uh, a wider <clears throat> bunch of modules available for use. Okay. Now, uh, let's put them into use in a simple example of uh, uh, visual navigation. Now, the input to the robot is uh, uh, 
uh, occupancy grid map of the environment, and the robot also has a uh, um, front-facing uh, RGB camera, and, the, uh, and then the robot wants to navigate it to a designated uh, location. It is partially observable because a uh, robot does not have a good initial, initial location, so it's uncertain about the, uh, its uh, location, and they need to gather observations in order to localize itself and reach the goal eventually. Now, suppose we want, or we will set it in this in a, in a imitation learning setting. Uh, we are going to have, uh, we train the uh, robot system using uh, 10K different maps, uh, 10,000 different maps, and, and we want to uh, test it uh, in novel environments this time, this 500 different uh, maps. Now, suppose I want to solve this problem using a pure classic model based approach. Now, in, in the CS meter and planner and maybe in the controller as well, um, I need an observation model. And this is going to be a conditional probability distribution. It's conditioned on the map and the current pose of the robot. And it's a distribution over the space of visual observations, basically images. Now, just think about the 10,000 different environments and the, the different images that can occur over there. Now, the building a generative conditional distribution over such a space is <coughs> in fact very difficult, right? And this is the, the uh, and the, and the, without building such a model, then the rest of the uh, the, the the system will be uh, in danger. Now, alternatively, if we try to um, attempt, if we attempt on the pure data-driven model uh, and train it, uh, train the uh, a black box neural network model, but the difficulty here is that I have a lot of different environments, and the question will be uh, the generalization performance. Okay. Now, if we train instead of using uh, the proposed DAN architecture, now this is the performance. Um, uh, comparison um, with the uh, the pure data driven approach, right? So the uh, the, the data driven approach does not perform very well because essentially because of lack of generalization, and the DAM performs much much better even in absolute terms. The main difference is the uh, structure prior imposed by the robot algorithms for state estimation, planning, and control, as well as the models. So clearly, the, 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 by imposing this algorithmic structure on the neural network architecture, improves the performance for generalization. And actually, we can explicitly test for, the, test for this. Right? So um, now, in this uh, controlled experiment, we can start with something like a QMDP uh, decision-making algorithm and uh, encoded in a, in the, in a, as a neural network. And we are gradually going to relax the uh, algorithmic structure prior imposed on the network. And for example, we can replace um, the Bayesian histogram filter by a generic uh, LSTM. I just remember the history. Um, and this, if I do this, roughly I get uh, uh, a DQN network. And further, I can I, we can go st one step further and remove all the structure uh, constraints and and just end up with a vanilla uh, recursive neural network. And as we can see, that if when we gradually reduces uh, the uh, removes the structure uh, from the neural network and the performance uh, de degrades. Now, the, the performance gap becomes even larger if we do this, test the same thing in a larger environment. And this is to be expected because uh, the larger the environment, the more important structure assumptions is going to be. Right? Now, let's compare to the other extreme, which is the classic model-based approach. Now, in this case, uh, the classic model-based approach doesn't do too badly, but still then performs better. Uh, why? Because then we'll take uh, these modules for state estimation and planning and the control and connect them together and using data to train the entire network end to end and therefore making the entire system much more robust. And by, um, by compensating for the, some of the brittle model assumptions. Now, the one way this can happen is what we kind of call a, a wrong model to fix a wrong wrong algorithm. This is kind of cute, right? So what is a wrong algorithm? And well, it's basically an approximate algorithm, right? So think about a decision-making procedure like a search. Now, now to get to the true optimal solution, maybe I have to search for a long horizon and I cannot afford it. So here, we intentionally reduce the uh, search horizon to something like 
25, while the actually the, to reach for the, um, the goal and it requires a longer horizon. Okay? Now, normally in a pure classic model-based approach, we will take this approximate algorithm and combine it with what we hope for uh, is a true model. And this time, and in the experiments, in the controlled experiment, we just use the ground truth model. For example, turning right and ends up with a state transition model, something like this, right? So, so the robot will stay exactly in the same place after turning right, but the, its orientation will change by 90 degrees. Now, unfortunately, the, uh, it doesn't work well because I intentionally shortened the search horizon and therefore it doesn't even reach the goal. Most of the time, it will have to fail. Now, if we just take exactly the same thing and embed it in the neural network and then train it from uh, train it using data, and then what will happen then? Well, it will learn an action that's kind of interesting. And it learned, learned this action that if you look compare the state transition model, that it does something different. I mean, turning right no longer means kind of turning right. You can see that the, the position changes. Now, we stared at this transition model uh, for a while and understood that this is roughly it does. It's basically turning right, followed by a step forward. Why does it do that? Because, because of the training data, so most of the time, after the robot turning right, it just moves forward. It's very unlikely after turning right, it turns again, right? So, so equivalently, it's a learning a transition model is basically for a macro action of two steps when it's turning right and followed by move forward. Now, this now this uh, macro action is two in one. It effectively reduces the search horizon and enables the uh, the um, the robot to go much further than the search the, the my short uh, planning horizon uh, dictates and it actually uh, reached the goal and and performs much better so so here the wrong um, algorithm is not approximate algorithm the wrong model means that uh, that it does something more than and the, it's different, I and mean, it learns a transition model that's different from the ground truth transition model. But once you put these two rounds together, it actually does the right thing and reaches the goal. Right. Now, end-to-end -end training also helps in other ways as well. And for example, that maybe that, that I make uh, simplifying assumptions on the transition model that does not account for the obstacles. And then um, through learning, the, the robot will learn a, uh, um, a cost function that penalizes for co collisions. Right. Sometimes that, uh, that I assume, uh, maybe incorrectly, that the state is fully observable, while actually in reality it's not uh, because of uncertainty. And then the end-to-end um, -end training will learn to reward those actions that gathers information. So I explicitly give uh, a reward to encourage exploration and information gathering and so on and so forth. Okay. So, um, now, if we put this, all these things together, then we can also apply it to a setting where um, we have partially observable and visual navigation, but not uh, having a model. In a novel environment, the robot is gets dropped in a new place, in a novel place. This is a setting for the uh, CVPR habitat challenge in 2020. Right? So the robot basically does not have, is in an unknown environment without a prior map, and then needs to reach a destination that's specified by a pair of coordinates. Now, since we do not have a map, uh, we need to, in addition, to uh, develop a, a module for for building the map, basically SLAM, right? And uh, and we um, developed this uh, uh, differentiable SLAM net, and based, uh, using a base algorithm, basically that's the uh, fast SLAM, right? and uh, and. And the robot as explores the environment, it builds a spatial representation of it, and eventually it reaches a goal. And we submitted for uh, for the for the for the challenge and for a few brief days, and uh, it actually gets to the top of the leaderboard. I think that happened two times, but every time very briefly for a few days. And it's like all leaderboards; it's uh, the top place is transitory, right? Okay. Now let's. Uh, uh, put this damn thing uh, on real uh, robot systems. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, um, for, for navigation, uh, a real robot navigation systems. Now suppose you come to visit our school, right? So I want to come to my office in this building, 
All I need to give you is a schema schematic uh, floor map of the building. And most of us will be competently navigating this space and get to, to my office. Now, uh, how about the robot? Unfortunately, that uh, to the robot, these days at least, when we say a map, uh, this is what the robot needs for a map, right? And, uh, and a high density, high resolution uh, point cloud. So what we would like to do is to um, go from uh, this high density, uh, resolution um, point cloud to a schematic map. And so the robot will just uh, use this uh, visitor's map, this floor plan, and to go anywhere on NUS campus. And this is what we call uh, human level uh, robot navigational intelligence. Okay, that's what we would like to do. Now, in order to achieve this, I mean, there's a huge amount of variability. You should think about the different places the robot to get to, different buildings, and, and, and the indoor and outdoor, and so on and so forth. But I have this important observation here, all right? So there are two kinds of variability. One is geometric and combinatorial. So that consists of the like, different kind of layout in the buildings, different shapes of the buildings, and different routes, streets, and so on and so forth, right? But also that uh, on the right you can see is visual complexity, the different kind of paved uh, pathways, carpeted the floors and grasslands and so on and so forth, and peoples and obstructions around. Now, uh, the visual complexity is mostly local. So, and the, and the global and the local complexity are mostly orthogonal to each other. And that, that motivates us to de develop this intention that architecture, which is a hierarchical, at a high level, uh, we just rely on, on this uh, schematic uh, floor plan, and we can do a little bit of image processing and turn that into an occupancy grid. And then uh, we can uh, use any uh, search algorithm, for example, A star, and to search for a path to the destination. Uh, at the low level, we train a neural network controller that takes two input. One is an, a forward-looking RGB camera, and then the other one is this thing we call the intention. The intention consists of three channels. Uh, the first channel is uh, a, a, a local patch of the um, um, map at the current robot location. The second channel is the piece of the path that the robot has just executed, uh, indicated in red over here. And then uh, the blue piece is the third channel that indicates the path segment the robot is about to execute. And we encode all these things together as a single image and feed it into the neural network. Right? And the output of the neural network is just a steering command and for robot execution. And once the robot executes it, and we will have to relocalize the robot on the map, but we do not need a very accurate localization because we have a course map to start with anyway. And then we replan and, uh, and execute the first step of the action and then we close the loop, right? So this is a very intuitive uh, 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 robot navigation architecture. It's uh, uh, very similar uh, to the way that uh, we humans drive under the guidance of a GPS unit. So if you just recall the way that we usually use a GP, um, GPS unit while driving, every so often the GPS unit will either show this icon thing or just tell us that 0 0.2 miles ahead, please turn left, right? So this is basically our intention, even though our intention has a little bit uh, more, uh, a little bit richer information contained in it. Basically, what we are doing is to replace the human driver by a trained neural network controller. Now, in terms of uh, uh, then, what we have over here is the <coughs> a planning module, which is uh, um, purely model-based, and then uh, uh, an, uh, uh, a neural network control module, which is uh, basically a black box and trained uh, from data. Now the planning module, the model-based planning model relies on a coarse abstract map. It handles global combinatorial complexity. And then uh, at the low level, uh, the trained neural network controller handles local perceptual complexity and we stack them together in a, in a hierarchy. Right? Now this is uh, our training result and generalization. Right? After training in a set of environments, the robot can navigate in new environments 
with very different we visual trained on the first floor geology. of our building and they take it to the second floor floor for testing and you can see that the visually the first and floor and second that looks very different one has a carpeted floor the other one is a laminated floor and the second floor along the corridor also have these uh, uh, tables along the hallways uh, now more than that and there is also difference in terms of their geometry our first our building is on a hill and, and the, the the footprint of the building on the first floor is a lot larger and if you look at on the right and in the testing environment that second floor basically is a long corridor and I mentioned that, that we want to take our uh, robot to anywhere uh, on US campus. And this is our uh, current progress. We haven't managed to go anywhere, uh, everywhere yet, but we did manage to go quite a number of different places in the neighborhood of our, uh, our school computing. We travel through this outdoor environment, say, the people, these people are not staged. And just on that day of the test, we encounter these people. I guess this is a semi outdoorish environment. It gets indoors, and we set up this obstacle course. Oops, an unexpected obstruction. The bots are getting around it. Glass doors. Okay, so you can climb stairs, but that's because of the boss dynamics. The same thing. can uh, also uh, interact with uh, people and upholding uh, people. This uh, all comes from the training room and the controller. You can see that it can operate uh, in a wider variety of different uh, environments, both indoor and outdoor and semi-outdoors. And also, if you look uh, to the left of most of the column and in the middle, and sometimes we encounter these uh, uh, construction barriers because I don't So uh, the idea uh, of uh, uh, dance quite general, it applies not only to robot navigation, but uh, manipulation as well, right? So for manipulation planning, we often, what we often do is to use a simplified uh, object model and the interaction, its interaction with the, with the environment, right? So that creates a gap between the model and the reality in terms of uh, dynamics and the, and the perception. And, uh, and that's why that uh, oftentimes that the planned uh, robot manipulation um, policies sometimes fail. Now, in order to deal with this gap, uh, here is the, the usual approach. Right? So um, based on our model, we will compute a policy, usually parameterized by some parameters, and we execute this parameterized policy and, uh, and in the, in the, on, the, on the robot and finds out that does not work and then the robot engineer comes in then it, it, he or she tunes these parameters and it, it does so um, after multiple iterations eventually this policy works now what i would like to do is to uh, uh, replace um, and avoid human intervention and and achieve this automatically through robot learning so here is our main idea so we want to uh, embed uh, robot simulation model, a parameterized robot simulation model in the policy representation. And then we are going to execute the policy in the real world and get real world feedback and use that as uh, to, and use that information to tune the simulation parameters. So the simulation model closely matches the reality and eventually um, and choose the best actions. Okay. So this is the reality. So we are going to apply this to deformable object manipulation. And then we want to push this rope and through the gap um, between the, uh, between the obstructions. Now, uh, we are going to use depth perception. Therefore, the, uh, the gap between the model and the reality in terms of perception is relatively small. Uh, however, uh, now we are going to uh, 
use a very simplified, extremely simplified model. Uh, instead of using a sophisticated uh, uh, deformable object model, we are just going to treat the object as a rigid stick. And, uh, and we are going to uh, try to close the gap between the model and the reality, which is deformable. Okay. Here is uh, 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 our algorithm, our differentiable on planner. So we will start um, by an initial policy uh, acquired from this approximate model, which assumes that the object is actually rigid. And then during the execution, uh, we are going to replan every, at every time step. And the way we do it is that starting at the current state, we are going to roll out uh, K trajectories. Now for the first trajectory, uh, the first step on this trajectory, we are going to take the action according to this initial policy, pi zero. Or after that, we are going to continue to follow this initial policy. For the remaining K minus one rollouts, the first step, we are just going to choose a random action for exploration. And after that, and we again, we're going to follow the initial policy. Okay. Now, when we roll out the policy for every time step, uh, we will need a, 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 a dynamic system dynamic model, right? And so we are going to use a, a, a general purpose particle based um, dynamics model um, that's also differentiable. It's called Diff Tai Chi. It's developed quite recently. I think it's from from MIT. Right? Now, if you treat this entire planner as a computational graph, um, realize that everything now is differentiable. Okay, and therefore that we can. Um, um, use the real world feedback and push the gradient backwards and adjust the uh, the parameters of the differentiable simulation. Okay. And, uh, and and if we do this, and uh, this is what, uh, what we get. So let me start by showing you that we have an initial policy, uh, which is based on the assumption of a rigid, a rigid body. And we apply it, um, well, first indeed to the rigid body, and you would expect that uh, there's no symmetrical gap, and there's no model, there's no gap between the model and the reality, and uh, and therefore it works. Now, next, I'm going to apply the same policy uh, to a rope. Now there is a gap between the model and the the reality, and therefore the policy fails. Right. Now, finally, I'm going to apply. Um, differentiable um, 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 differentiable planning and uh, this is and enable the task to succeed in here okay right. almost there Well, okay, I see your video has a little bit of problem, but uh, let me let me carry on. Okay. Um almost at the end. All right. So let me try to wrap up over here. All right. So Dan tries to encode the robot algorithms and the model into a neural net modules, and it connects this module them together into a, a robot learning system and train the system end-to-end uh, -end from data and optimizes for the uh, and task objective. Right? Now, uh, it absorbs both the model-based and the data-driven views. Right? Like uh, the uh, model-based system, it is modular and compositional. Right? So it combines and recombines these modules and therefore achieves strong generalization performance. And also by choice, uh, these modules are interpretable and not black boxes. And therefore, it's much easier to maintain and debug. It also the like uh, the data driven uh, uh, systems, and it is optimized uh, using data for the end task objective. Therefore, it is much more robust because uh, training from uh, from data uh, repairs some of the brittle model assumptions. Oh, we have barely, uh, I think, the scratch the surface of it then. And we probably um, brought up more um, questions than, than answers. Right? So if you were trying to apply then to a complex robot system, there are many questions here. The first one is about decomposition. Right? Now, 
right now we rely the most on on our intu intuition to decompose the system into modules of state estimation and control and planning and so on and so forth and these are good decompositions that we learned uh, uh, throughout the history of robotics but i was say that this decomposition is still based on an assumption of uh, human designers and engineers and uh, and uh, and are they the best for robot learning systems it's not entirely clear for example that the explicit 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 state representation between the modules do we really need it or maybe we can just leave that um, that latent and also how about um, the individual modules now for each of the module do we want it to encode a robot algorithm and a model? Or we can just treat it as a black box. If you just recall that in our, in our intention net system for robot navigation, that we have both, right? So we have a higher level, which is a classic model-based planner, and the low level is a black box uh, a neural network controller. And uh, that is flexible enough to allow us to use both. And also data, and how do we want to use data to train? And for a very large robot systems, unlikely we want to really apply then to the entire system. And do we, maybe we want to train uh, or pre-train at least the individual modules. If you want to do so, we will have to have intermediate data. Right? And finally, uh, optimizers. Now, the, the, the architecture choices that we have made would affect the performance of the of the optimizer or put it in a reverse way given an optimizer we will have to think about what architecture choices we are to make to facilitate optimization because that will decide the final performance right so i don't have answers um, or at least not um, principled answer to any of these questions but i do believe is that by answering some of these questions we will take then one step forward and get us closer to our dream of a general purpose intelligent robots uh, let me end by uh, thank you to all the wonderful people I have been working with, uh, my long-term collaborators, with and Lee, as well as uh, Tom, uh, Leslie Cabley and the Tomas Lozano Perez from MIT. And the, th the wonderful students I have been working with, um, Peter Cockers is the main author of the, um, of, the, of the differentiable algorithm network, and Wei Gao has been working on the intention net architecture, and Su Wei is, has been working very hard in order to make the deformable object manipulation work. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. That's wonderful. Okay, so I think some questions will probably come in from the chat um, or from the YouTube channel chat, I should say. Um, let me just ask you one about uh, this sort of a loaded question about your the, the overall goal at the start of the presentation. Um, yeah. When you think of artificial like AGI, artificial general intelligence, um, do you think your ultimate goal is to build an agent that can um, that can truly be general purpose at the human level, or do you think we'll end up with a series of machines that I mean, maybe I have a really good dishwashing robot, but I don't I don't depend on that dishwashing robot to also be able to um, I don't know wash my car or something just because it's just too much. Or do you think one robot one robot to to do it all eventually. Oh, okay. The the uh, whether we would want to have, uh, I think that uh, um, there are two ways that we want to think about um, um, robot intelligence. Right. So one is, um, um, uh, let's say that more pra pragmatic, and uh, uh, I want to have robots to to do a variety of different tasks. Right. And uh, um, do I want to train the robot for each of the tasks separately? Or I want to train the robots with a set of general skills and compose them. Right? So this is the, the, the really the key question of, I think I alluded to at the very beginning, it's about variability. Do I believe that the, the variability simply is a, a whole bunch of un disconnected things that I have no choice but to deal with one at a time. Do I believe that there are uh, 
principles and structure that we can exploit. And, uh, and, and by, uh, by learning these principles that I will eventually be able to develop general purpose intelligent robots. I tend to believe the latter, right? So, but unfortunately that at this moment in time that uh, um, despite the, 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 the advances in you know, the, uh, the, the, the machine learning, which is truly extraordinary and brought many wonderful things, but one thing that is we the ro the learning well, robot learning and learning in general that still doesn't do very well is abstraction, right? So, um, I think that it is uh, 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 outstanding challenge at the moment that, given a bunch of demonstrations, what can we learn from it, right? I mean, we can. I think by and large at the moment, what we can learn from it is some kind of uh, um, variability around the neighborhood of demonstration, uh, around, around the neighborhood of data, I should I say that uh, in general, right? And, uh, and what we want is to understand the underlying structure of the task domain, that the data, what we can learn from the data is to actually these various components. And then um, we will be also learn the structure of composition. I think that this is most likely that will lead to the greatest, greatest, um, strongest generalization performance. Okay, interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. I think uh, I, would, I would largely agree. That my own. personally, I would largely agree. <laughs> okay, so we do have a couple of. We have one comment from the chat uh, that uh, Adam says uh, thanks for the great talk. So there you go. That's one. Um, and uh, let's uh, go to Sep uh, Samavi. So Sep asked the question. He says thanks for the great talk. Um, have you used the Dan architecture in environments with dynamic agents, uh, like pedestrians walking around? And uh, what decomposition would make sense for predictions uh, in that case or interactions with other agents? All right, it's a great question. It's really interesting. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me ask, have we have we dealt with dynamic uh, uh, agents, right? We we did, uh, like if you remember, recall that in the video that, that there's people this like uh, moving around in front of people, these are all moving. So they, we have dealt with uh, dynamic agents, but we didn't deal with it, uh, very, I would say in a, in a great way, right? So what we did is like, uh, we gathered enough data Right, so the, yeah, there are people in front of it, but uh, it doesn't really matter who's in front of it. If you gather some amount of data, and uh, and if you just think about that, that how people uh, appear in the forward-looking images, there are not so much variability. You gather a bunch of data, then that's kind of okay, right? So, and also that keep in mind that this robot, the video is accelerated by three times. That this, so the robot does not move forward, uh, move very. Very, very fast. So uh, it's roughly speaking the normal walking speed and therefore it is dynamic, but not very dynamic, right? Now, if I want to um, deal with, let's say that, so I think the, the intent of the question is, would I be able to operate capably? Suppose this robot have to navigate in a crowd. My guess is most likely that would be difficult, right? So in that case that we actually have to have further decomposition. So what do we have to do is something like that we have to have a spatial representation, right? So instead of, so so right now it's just a full, I mean, the spatial representation is just the forward looking images and the output that will be the, um, uh, the, the steering commands. Now I actually probably need a bird eye view of the ground and that is what we need. And then I will be able to, I want to predict how the pedestrians move Right and uh, and uh, with re with respect to my uh, spatial representation, and then I can do reasoning, right? And I can put in all these binds, all these components together, and again represented as various neural network modules. And if I want, I can train them using data to um, to make it more robust because whatever prediction I can make probably is imperfect. And, uh, and I don't want to use very sophisticated uh, prediction models because in a crowded situation and uh, any sophisticated 
prediction models probably is not gonna work very well. I would rather that using simple prediction models and uh, and and then train the end-to-end -end from data in order to optimize for the navigation performance. This is again another example of what I kind of call the wrong model to kind of um well, this is what I, the, this is the, no this is the end-to-end -end training to fix the brittle assumptions in the prediction model okay very interesting yeah okay yeah i think and i i happen to know that uh, seth the student asking the question is familiar with this topic having recently done a project oh, okay. on pedestrian navigation <laughs> or navigation amongst pedestrians i should say so that's a great that's a great question actually just um the other thing that probably we have to consider just as a as a side note is uh, adversarial human actors um i don't know if anybody has seen there's a great video of uh, a robot deployed in incheon airport in uh, south korea and uh I think there's a, I think it's there. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of kids that they, they love yeah, the robot. Yeah, yeah, they get it. They, yeah. They get in front of it and try to block it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It can't move. You know, they push it and kind of, you know, it's like, Oh, uh, how do you, that's another, that's another situation. So maybe, you know, maybe in time we'll all become comfortable and we won't be so abused by these mm -hmm. mechanical devices. So we'll see. But um, anyway, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'll move on. Uh, Professor uh, Florian Shakurdi has a question as well. Uh, he says, great talk. Uh, there are some sensor observation models and dynamics models. Ah, that yeah, this is key. That involve non-differentiable parts um, that you just can't differentiate through due to the physics involved. Um, do we have to force those in some way to be differentiable, or do you need methods for inference that can handle models that um, have variables of that nature? Yeah, another great question. Uh, so, I, by and large, I did not uh, talk too much about. Uh, uh, how to make uh, uh, a complex algorithm differentiable. There are a lot of literature on that, but I will I'll give some examples in our, from our own work, right? So uh, in one piece, in one of, uh, in, in, in one of our uh, work, um, particle filter uh, networks, for example, um, it's not uh, very complex, but there's a one step there, uh, resampling, and that is not differentiable. Sampling is definitely not uh, differentiable. Now, what do we have to do? That uh, fortunately, that people, the smart people, have all worked out all sorts of solutions for these kind of things. Now, one thing is you can do soft resampling. So it's just a probability, right? So you get ninety percent of the time you will do resampling. Ten percent of the time you don't do resampling. That ten percent will allow you to push the gradient through. This is one kind of trick. The other one is more general. The sampling, basically, after all, we re rely on, on, on pseudo-random generators. And you can just think of that. You can just play a reparameterization, what they call the reparameterization trick, uh, in order to make it differentiable. So, so there are various, I would say that, that there are various tools and techniques people de um, developed in order to make complex algorithm differentiable. That is one approach. Now, the other approach, is that if I indeed fail into uh, in uh, uh, in in making my algorithm differentiable, does this whole thing just collapses and fall flat? No, it doesn't. All right. So so uh, again, um, ultimately, what ultimately what we need is to be able to optimize to to be able to optimize the parameters of the network uh, in order to match with uh, in order to match with data and to regress against the data. Now, differentiability makes the optimization much more efficient. Now, if we cannot, we will have to use other and then der um, not derivative based um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, optimization procedures. Um, for example, um, we can use uh, we can apply reinforcement learning. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, very, uh, very true. All right. Uh, thanks. So thanks, uh, Professor Shakurdi, for an excellent question, actually. Um, I think um, maybe there's one more coming through, but just in the meantime, I'll ask uh, one more question, since I have the uh, uh, opportunity to do so. Um, so you mentioned also um, not not some, you mentioned sort of older AI techniques, right? And then things like shaky and the fact that, you know, and I try to emphasize this in, in classes as well, like, let's not throw away this this fantastic history we have right every so do you think everything can be learned in a compositional manner this is maybe if i'm phrasing this correctly or do you think that um there's a role for say classical planning like non you know just like a, like strips or something on top of these uh compositional deep models 
Definitely. I think uh, uh, before we uh, answer the question of can, I think the question is do we want, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Assuming I, I think it, my goal is to develop highly capable intelligent robot systems. I don't really care that much about whether um, I, it's achieved through uh, learning from data or it's constructed by hand. Uh, either way, and as long as it leads to good performance. Now, uh, in practice, I have to make a choice that when facing a particular robot task, do I know enough about the domain that I can construct a good model? If I can, I am probably going to use a model-based approach. No, but if you look at the problem with things like in-hand manipulation is that we just plainly don't know enough about in-hand manipulation and the interaction and build, to build a good model. And, and also it happens to be the case that <coughs> we managed to gather enough data and the policy for whatever reason is relatively simple and, uh, and we can gather enough data to cover it. And that is really the one way to think about these two distinct, these two different views of robot system design. That when, I mean, and it's actually very intuitive. It basically says that, uh, well, if you know enough and you can build a model, please go ahead, do it. Otherwise, if you know that your policy or controller is simple enough and you can cover it and regress it against sufficient amount of data and you can get that amount of data, please go ahead and do that as well. And furthermore than that, if you say that about things like uh, uh, strips planning and, and PDDL and these days, these are basically abstractions, right? So, so if we think about a complex uh, robot system that let's say that the one that uh, has to go to the Mars or the moon and have to perform very complex tasks uh, without um, very limited, very limited human intervention. It surely has to perform sophisticated reasoning and, and over complex situations and many steps ahead. It is just quite imagine, unimaginable that it has to reason at the level of per like small action and moving forward by one centimeters or move the arm by 0 0.2 degrees and point to the sensor 0. Uh, upwards by 0 0.3 degrees. It cannot reason this level. There must be abstractions that be built on top of that. And, and, uh, and, uh, and there'll be mo and the hierarchy at the multiple levels in order to reason over um, uh, highly complex uh, uh, situations. So, so definitely that, uh, that uh, classic planning has an important role and planning and reasoning in general has an important role to play over here. Now, one thing that we have to address, however, is that uh, oftentimes that uh, these uh, abstract models are based on simplifications and um, these uh, models that are curated manually and we make simplifying assumptions when we build this model. This is the places where things tend to go wrong, right? Those, simplic those simplifying assumptions that doesn't always hold, right? So this is the place where like if we encode these models into a damn form, we are kind of trying to do that a little bit, uh, not making enough progress yet, which is that, so, I mean, you can see that you can think about the intentional architecture has a flavor of this, right? It's a hierarchical policy representation. At the low level, the policy is just basically mapping continuous signals from images to, to steering commands. At the high level, it has an occupancy grid. Occupancy grid is, in fact, it is you can think of that as kind of close to a symbolic representation because it's discrete, right? And, and this is already a form of abstraction. And on top of that, this grid and the path, you can form more sophisticated sophisticated uh, uh, models uh, using PDDL or, or strip and so on and so forth. And so you can see that you can form is a hierarchy, um, hierarchical policy representation, and then you can train it from data, right? And then in the training process, and, and, and hopefully that this uh, training from data will fix some of those brittle assumptions. And that is one benefit that then, then offers. Oh, yeah, great. Okay, so I we're just about we're at the end. So I will just summarize, I think some key points if I if I may. Um, one thing hierarchy, incredibly important, as you said, right? Some compositional um, approaches are needed. Um, also, um, uh, 
in the corner cases will kill you or you know or ruin your robot <laughs> it's the ones that you don't understand in your simplified modeling assumptions right the the driver going backwards or the the, the um student on a scooter driving the wrong way down a one-way street that ruins your self-driving car I've seen that happen a few times recently um and uh the other thing is uh, you know you i think you've you something that we forget maybe as robotists is being lumped into sort of learning camp or class or whatever you know camp we happen to be in at a specific time is that consumers ultimately probably don't care <laughs> if their Roomba <laughs> is right. is reasoning symbolically with strips and the PDBL or whether it's using a deep neural network all they you know all you know my dishwashing I just want clean dishes that are not broken and how it actually achieves that task is is actually um uh, of no real, you know, to me as a as a purchaser of a dishwashing robot, I, I honestly don't care as long as it works well. So <laughs> that may be something that for us to keep in the back of our minds. Okay, so uh, we're just uh, just past uh, 11 uh, a.m. here, 11 p.m. for David. So thank you again, David, so much for taking the time. Uh, we'll just do a, uh, I'll do a clap on behalf of okay. the, uh, the YouTube audience. Uh, our host, Kimberly, will clap as well. Uh, thank you again. A really compelling talk. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Um, um, and uh, yeah, we, we look forward if, um, to seeing more of the, uh, the results in this area. Can't wait. So with that, we'll close. Thank David one last time. And I uh, will see you, I think, for the next seminar coming up in just uh, 